Welcome to another episode of Million Dollar Stories, where we get to interview authors from all over the world. I love learning from my guests, and I think I'm going to learn something today. Uh, as you guys know, I'm a finance major. I went to Duquesne University. I just never really fell in love with trading because I just didn't feel like I had control. That's why I got into real estate. However, since I have been working with entrepreneurs on their books, I did work with a guy who did teach me a little bit about active trading, and I thought it was fascinating how he views the market. And uh, the guest we have today wrote a book called Advanced Futures Trading Strategies, 30 Fully Tested Strategies for Multiple Trading Styles and Timeframes. And Robert, or Robert, I said Robert, it's Rob. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> that's fine. Rob Carver, thank you so yeah, much fine. for being here, man. That's fine. In fairness, on the front of the book, it does say Robert. So you can see why that would be confusing. Um, yeah, I should also say I've actually written four books. Um, that's the most recent, but uh, yeah. Excellent. So why did you write it? And maybe tell us a little bit about your background leading up to it. Um, so let me see. I, I did my first trade probably about 24 years ago um which was kind of during the sort of tech boom um i guess um so the kind of internet craze and the nasdaq was going to the moon and all this sort of stuff was happening um and then i i, I did uh, economics university and um, when i graduated i actually got a job working as a as a uh well, my full job title was exotic fixed income interest rate derivatives trader so kind of fairly um kind of quanty mathy sort of trading um but not actually systematic so i was doing what i'd call discretionary trading so i was actually you know this decisions whether to buy or sell were made essentially you know by me as a human being if you like although supported by you know lots of kind of maths and equations and spreadsheets and, and software packages to kind of value things um and then um i, I then sort of spent a couple of years doing something else working in economic research and then I went back into finance to work for a hedge fund. Um, so there was, I was running a, a futures trading portfolio. Um, and um, at its peak, I was managing, let's say, a few billion dollars. Um, so it was quite a quite a big job. Um, quite stressful. Um, and um, well, that was a lot of fun. I, I bet decided at some point, you know, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> And uh, actually, about about ten years ago now, almost exactly, I I decided to quit. Um, and so for the last ten years, I've done various things. Um, I've traded my own money uh, systematically using a fully automated trading strategy, um, and also do some in other other investing as well in a le less automated way. Um, and and uh, I, I do some some university teaching. I do a bit of consultancy. Um, but I really got into writing these books because I wanted a kind of um, pass on to people um, the sort of information about trading, sp specifically systematically, but more so about trading and kind of knowing what you're doing. Um, so, you know, they say that trading is a kind of a mixture of an art and a science. I guess I'm very much at the scientific end, but I think even traders who, you know, would perhaps consider themselves artists still need to know some a lot of the science around things like, you know, how big your position should be, how you should manage your risk, you know, how long you should hold positions for, when you should close positions all of these things are you know the sort of science behind them rather than art and there's definite principles that everyone should follow um so yeah i've written a series of books kind of expanding those principles and yeah the most recent one specifically on futures trading please tell me you're making more money working for yourself investing for yourself than for the other companies are you because i would love to hear the person leaving the corporate space and you know, working for themselves and making more and you probably sleep better at night. So is that the case? Uh, well, the the sleeping better at night is definitely true. A hundred percent. But actually, no, I, I probably take in something like an 80 percent pay cut, I'd say. Wow. Um, which I guess reflects really how grossly overpaid people who work <laughs> in finance are. Um, because, you know, 20 um, percent um, of what I am before is still plenty yes and that makes a lot of sense details, but, so when so, you're yeah. managing billions right that's what you're saying is that it's a, just a different it's a different animal as compared to yourself that makes a lot of sense yeah um, for the, for my audience they might not know what futures trading is and i think a sure. lot of my audience knows about obviously forex and crypto and just you know stock st stock trading in general but i just want to give them the the classic definition futures trading involves buying or selling contracts that obligate the trader to purchase or sell an asset at a predetermined price on a specific future date. 
I will say that to me is super complicated. And the reason <laughs> why is because you need to have a vision of the future, in my opinion, or a great understanding of the market more so than anybody else around you. What I've realized is that if I'm able to understand the market now, I could probably pick out what's going to happen over the next two to three months, but I don't know what date and I don't know what the price is going to be. I just kind of base it's going to go up or down. Case in point, um, I was able to see in 2020, 2021, when Biden got in, I thought to myself, you know, what would he do? What What is his regime going to do? Okay, he's probably going to print a lot of money and I think he's going to raise interest rates. So my my investment strategy was, why don't I get into real estate more, be a little bit more bold on that because I think it'll be, um, the more they print, inflation is going to go up, raising the uh, the value of the property. But also, as interest rates go up, it's only going to hurt the middle class and lower class. So they're not going to get into vesting. So it's going to be a great window of opportunity, and the rich will get much richer. So I saw that, but I didn't know the time frame or whatnot. How are you able to look at the market and see, I don't know how far out, six months, a year, five years? Tell me what you uh, what you look at to make a uh, position um so trade trading futures is, isn't that different from trading the underlying assets so you know one of the nice things about futures is you can have futures in different things so this this futures that cover for for you know foreign exchange example this futures there are a couple of futures that trade crypto um you know there's plenty of futures trading where you can trade um you know bonds for example or equities and so on and so forth um the the price of the futures is very closely tied to the current price of the asset so if you look to the s p 500 spot price which you can trade very easily by buying like a the, the spy etf for example and you compare that to the um the the, the, fu the price of the the next futures contract which um will well there's one that's expiring in a few days but if we move ahead to the one after that it'll be which will be expiring in march you won't see a big difference in the price really um and the, the kind of relationship to those two is is driven mostly by things that are pretty easy to kind of estimate. So to really betting on the future is not really that different from betting on the, the current price. The, the the kind of sort of forecasting you have to do isn't significantly different. There are a few nuances in in how the price is different, but it's not it's not that different. So there's nothing I mean the, the most the thing about futures that's potentially the most dangerous, I suppose, is that you can get a lot of leverage with them. Um, so that makes them a lot a lot riskier than than you know just buying stocks with cash, for example. Um, but you know once once you've kind of accounted for that, it, trading futures isn't that different from trading anything else. It's just a very convenient way of trading lots of different assets, whereas trading a lot of these underlying assets is potentially quite hard. So, do you have some type of um, calling to a certain industry, or do you look at the market in general? And I guess that kind of leads into. Um, probably one of your skill sets is not to be emotional, right? You are very logical. You're very analytical. And I would think that the reason why the market is what it is, is because people are emotional. Therefore, there's many giant swings, which means if there's a, an attack on the country, a war starting, or a politician says something, things can swing really fast. So I don't know if you stay in like a, you have a buy box or you look at the market in general and how difficult is it? to stay in this game if you have any type of emotional response to what you see out there? I guess there's sort of two separate questions there. One is in terms of how, what I, what I'm actually trading. So most of the time I'm trading, if you, um, say if I was trading equities, I'd be trading the index futures. So I wouldn't be looking at individual companies in the S&P. I'm not looking at Apple. I'm not looking at Tesla. I'm looking at the S&P as a whole or the NASDAQ as a whole and trading that as an index. Um, I do trade individual stocks in the UK. Um, but um, you know that that's a relatively small part of my portfolio. Um, in terms of emotion, so actually, I would say I'm I'm actually a, uh, I'm not actually a very good trader because I am I do get emotionally attached to positions like most people do. Um, and you know, in the past, when I've not traded in a systematic way, when I've you know traded on gut feeling, if you like, or some kind of analysis without any kind of system, um, I have consistently found myself making errors about um, you know being greedy well the classic kind of greed you know greed and fear right so getting greedy about a position or being afraid about a position um and that's why i trade systematically so i wouldn't say i mean I, I probably come across as you know as a very kind of analytical 
emotionless robotic guy but but actually when it comes to trading i'm probably just as emotional as the next guy which is why i personally like to trade systematically and that's how i deal with that yeah i think it, you seem like a numbers guy and i think that I, that... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that i'm definitely a numbers guy yeah, yeah you seem like it, and that's probably why you're so uh great at this man um in your book you do talk about how to measure and forecast risk now i think that if you can manage risk um, and if you can handle it emotionally and then you can, um, you know, bring out your best uh, whenever risk is at its greatest, I think that makes you a great entrepreneur in general. And I think that makes you a great leader. So, I mean, there's probably things that you're talking about in this book that um, transcend investing. But uh, how do you measure and forecast risk? Um, well, I, I guess in, in, in a basic sense, you're trying to work out, you know, what what the likely um sort of upside and downside of a particular position or your whole portfolio is um and you're, you're doing that most of the time based on historic data um so primarily i'm looking at so the last 30 days of of price movements and saying okay i'm, I'm kind of and that actually is, is a pretty good forecast for what price movements are going to be in the short term following that um so you know let's say if i hold my positions for a month it turns out if i look at returns over the last month that's a pretty good guide in terms of deviation um, as to what the you know the the um, the movements will be in the future, um, and they're, they're, so actually that kind of forecasting of risk in financial markets is is is, is quite good. We can forecast risk pretty well. What we can't do as as well is forecast returns, or we'd all you know we'd all be rich. It's much harder to say what returns will be over the next um, month, for example. Um, you know, you if you can get it right fifty one out of hundred times, and you're, you're probably doing quite well. Um, so that that's the primary um, way that I forecast risk. I mean, I guess any risk management is about either using historic data or if historic data is not really relevant or potentially, you know, too benign, trying to kind of think about what worst case scenario could be. Um, so, um, you know, if, if, for example, if an instrument, let's, let's take an example of, of, I don't know, let's say a crypto coin just just launches, it's a brand new crypto coin, you've got no historic data. But you can say, well, this is a small crypto coin, and I know that it's very likely that that could fall by, you know, fifty percent in one day. That's not that unlikely. So even if, even if that hasn't actually happened yet, I, you know, you'd want to size your positions on the assumption that that could happen because it's not inconceivable. Um, I mean, it's always it's very hard to to, you know, be sometimes sufficiently pessimistic and really forecast the absolute worst things that could happen because you know they're they're so called black swans, they're complete surprises um and um you know if you were to go down the rabbit hole of imagining all the horrible things that are going to happen well you you wouldn't invest anything you just you know keep keep your money under the bed i guess um because you you know you'd be worried about banks failing and suppose amongst other things um so you know you, you 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 can go too far down that that particular rabbit hole but you know people who work in risk management hedge funds do spend time thinking about scenarios like well you know what if you know this historic event happened again tomorrow or what if something that hasn't happened yet in history happens again tomorrow um and that's a that's a pretty good um way i think to manage risk generally because you as you say all business is about risk management and um you know you'd be crazy for example to open say a restaurant um i think like 80 percent of restaurants fail in the first year so you'd be crazy to open a restaurant if you didn't have enough working capital to to last for at least 12 months for example as, you know, as an example of that. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I would love to, for you to paint a picture of what it was like to manage billions of dollars. What was your life like? Uh, I don't think anybody listening could really relate to that. But are you meeting with different companies consistently? And the reason why I bring this up is because the more I analyze the S&P 500, I think 80% of them are owned by one, two, or three different hedge funds, the BlackRock, Vanguard, a couple other ones. So I look at these companies, I'm thinking they have so much control and power over the CEOs of the S&P 500. So when you are a part of this huge machine, what is that like? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to correct a couple of misconceptions there, if you don't mind. So yes, please. The, the BlackRock and Vanguard, they're, they're not hedge funds primarily. They're, they're index providers. So, you know, they've got these big passive ETFs um, and that, you know, that's why they have such a big share of, of the these various companies. Um, and because they're passive ETFs, they don't actually um, take that much part in sort of, you know, getting involved with managing or directing the management or 
or voting in particular ways. I mean, there has been some controversy recently about the way that these funds vote, and you could argue that they've got too much power and that the underlying people who are investing in these ETS, you know, you know, should be should have that power instead. And the, there's perhaps mechanisms by which that can be achieved. But 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 generally speaking, um, you know, the head the, the active hedge funds that are in the business of putting pressure on company management are much smaller and own a much smaller percentage of, of these businesses. Um, but of course, you know, they can still have an impact. Um, I, I, so get, to go back to me personally, so actually, again, I wasn't investing in individual companies, so I wouldn't, I was investing in, in index futures um, and across different asset classes. In fact, I was managing the fixed income portfolio. So um, it was, it was really bonds, interest rate swaps and things like that, that, that the futures are based on. Um, so it, you know, so it's, it's very different from what people imagine a, you know, a, a sort of hedge fund to, to be. So a systematic futures trading hedge fund, you know, most of the time you're, you're basically looking at historical data, computer models of the past, building trading strategies, and then running those strategies, um, you know, with the real money to, to hopefully be profitable. So, um, you know, m my life would look much more like that of a university professor than a kind of classical hedge fund manager. Although we are you privy to certain information? Are you able to see data that scares you of what ha what's happening in the market uh, or what you think is going to happen in the market that, you know, the average person will never, ever be able to understand? Is that is that part of the business, part of the job? Um, I mean, there are there are funds where where that sort of thing could potentially happen. So, for example, I guess. um if you were run, if let's say you're working for a bank, you'd be able to see things like flows in the FX market because the FX market's mostly OTC; it's not traded on exchange, so that that information is not generally available. Um, but but no, I mean you know, unless you're talking about the sort of this new world of alternative data where people are collecting different kinds of data, but we were focusing mainly on prices, so price information is available to everybody all the time very easily. So you know, we had zero kind of inside information, I would say. And so you do talk a lot about diversifying um, your positions. And so can you explain what you mean by that? I mean, you're talking about, uh, um, I guess, different um, time periods for whenever you call or whenever you set, place a put. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how you do it. But when, when you say diversify, what do you mean and how do you do that? So there's, there's different ways you can diversify. Um, so you can diversify your, your trading strategy. You can do different kinds of strategy. Um, so, you know, the, the, a big part of the strategies that I used to run and still run is so-called trend following or momentum, where you, you're basically buying things that have gone up and, you know, and hoping they carry on going up. Um, so you can diversify that by adding other kinds of strategies to it, with different characteristics. Um, you can also, as you say, diversify over time frames. So you could be looking at, you know, sticking to trend following. You'd be looking at slow trends, medium speed trends, fast trends. Um, the, the market tends to, behave differently at, over different horizons um and you can also get diversifications because you know you're going to get slightly different positions for looking at different horizons um but actually the the best way of diversifying is probably to to have things that are as uncorrelated as possible so you know someone who says oh yeah i've got six different crypto coins in my wallet i'm diversified well not really because <laughs> no, they're all not. they're yeah, all crypto well, and... i realized yeah they're all going to move together. Um, but even and if someone who owns 10 stocks and say, like, oh, I'm diversified, well, they're all US tech stocks. Actually, you're not diversified. They're going to move together a lot, a lot more closely. And again, that's all the advantage of futures because um, so I, I could potentially hold positions in 150 different futures. And that covers everything from, you know, like I said, S&P, US 10 year bonds, things like gold, things like crypto, things like wheat you know it's a it's a huge gamut of, of very uncorrelated assets which it's it's hard to get um unless you're accessing it through futures now this is not really in your neck of the woods i don't think but uh, maybe you have insight on this Do you, are you familiar with um gamestop what happened there a couple of years ago with uh yeah Robin yes Hood? of course yeah yeah you'd have to have been living under a rock not to have heard about that right yeah so <laughs> i yeah i don't know if if there's any type of connection with that from what you've seen maybe behind closed doors, but what were your thoughts on that? Because that kind of exposed how rigged the system is, in my opinion. So what were your thoughts from somebody who is very well versed in this world? What sorry, I don't understand. Why why did it why they, was the system, they system rigged? It. They they stopped it from people losing big time, right? The 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 people who 
were at the, the holding the switches set it so there was a a, a limit that the, how much they could lose when technically the game was in favor of the little guy and we could we could really take a lot of these rich people down if that makes sense so well, they my, stopped my understanding it my understanding of what actually happened was obviously a lot of people were trading through robin hood yes um and the way that um stock settles um is that you need a certain amount of working capital as a broker to to run your business and the bigger your positions are the more working capital you need um and what what my understanding of what happened is that the, the robin hood effectively ran out of capital um not because they were you know losing money or illiquid but just purely because they you know they had such a huge number of people on, on wanted to do on one side of the trade and they didn't have the capital to to put against that um on on the exchange and with their prime brokers um so they had to do two things firstly they had to, to kind of you know roll down the window if you like and say sorry guys no more no more gain stock bets the time being and then they had to go and borrow i think it was eight billion dollars so i don't know the exact number but it was it was a lot of money that's for a lot of money very quickly um to to support the size of those positions so um i i kind of disagree with you saying that it was sort of a deliberate decision by some kind of dark behind the car and establishment figures to <laughs> to go against the little guy i you know i that's uh i respect your opinion case. i looked at it as a casino and the gamblers were winning and the casino said whoa whoa whoa, whoa we're stopping never mind we're done that's it and the and the gamblers like wait a second this is my chance this is this is what we're here for you can't yeah, close but, up the window now i mean well, like, uh, you know if you go with the casino analogy like you know you'd be at casino making bigger and bigger let's say you're at a casino and you're making bigger and bigger bets at some point you're going to hit a table limit um, and you might be like, well, come on, I'm, I know I'm going to win. I know I'm going to win. Um, you know, why can't I kind of bet more? Well, like, no, we've got a table limit because that's that's the maximum that, that we can cope with. Um, and, um, you know, that that's not because the, the casino is kind of biased against you. It's just the question of of the, the system you know, managing risk because um, the consequences of a company like Robinhood being able to allow investors to put unlimited bets on ultimately would have, you know, would have probably led to the all of those little people, as you call them, losing a lot of money um, when Robin Hood went, went bust because it, it would have done at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, you do bring up uh, crypto. Uh, I'm in the world of real estate more so than crypto, even though I have a few positions in crypto, Bitcoin and Hex and uh, Ethereum and all the other stuff. So I don't pay really pay attention. I've, it's very speculative. However, I see the future that the dollar is going down. You have bricks coming into play. Crypto seems like maybe 50 years from now it's going to be a major player. But um, what are your thoughts on this? It seems like you know this world a little bit. So um, give me your give me your initial thoughts. Um, so my my connection with crypto is limited to a couple of things. Firstly, I, I trade Bitcoin and Ethereum futures. Um, but to be honest, that that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean I, you know, because I'm trading purely systematically. It doesn't mean that I'm systematically bearish or bullish crypto. I just take positions that the you know that my system tells me to um i'm also um a consultant to a, a crypto hedge fund um doing research for them um but my actual personal opinion about crypto to be honest is a uh, i think it's a horrible thing that's a waste of resources and energy and is effectively one of the purest ponzi schemes known to man and just seem to be systematically ripping off a lot of a lot of people who frankly can ill afford to lose the money so my sincere hope is that in 50 years time if i'm still here to see it which probably won't be um that it that, that you know that crypto is at best something it was maybe 10 years ago which which is just a kind of little small very small part of the economy used mainly by by drug dealers on the internet <laughs> you're an honest man i love it that's great so even though you analyze it you help people understand it you're not a big believer in it. That's pretty fascinating, man. It's great. Um, and so what are your thoughts on the U? I mean, it seems like you're more of a global uh, futures trader, right? That's what it is. It's not U.S. based at all. It's what do you see in the U.S.? I'm a, most of my audiences in the U.S. Are, are, do you have a lot of optimism in the market? Do you see a lot of um, I think I think I see a lot of consolidation of companies in the future, right? There's going to be the the hedge funds and the, the bigger companies are going to keep buying up uh other companies so i i don't have a lot of optimism when it comes to the government getting bigger i mean that's definitely gonna get bigger but it's gonna make the world worse i think the companies are gonna get bigger 
I'm a big believer in take that, take back control of your life and start a business, get multiple revenue streams. And yes, invest in the market because you can have your money work for you. But I don't think that it's going to get better when it comes to the market itself. So maybe that's just my position. What do you see in the US? What are your thoughts? Um, so one advantage of trading purely systematically is I, I don't ever have to have an, an opinion on any of these things. Um, you know, as you, you said, you'd find it hard to forecast what's going to happen in a few months in the future. I'm, I'm exactly the same. I mean, I, 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 I don't really know. And, you know, my, my, my kind of trading positions don't depend on any opinion I might have about the, the future of, of the U S economy or any, or anything else. So, so sorry. <laughs> and, I, and it's not really perhaps what you're hoping to hear and, and not, not a very, you know, useful thing to say for your, probably most of your listeners, but, but, um, but yeah. You're one of the Sorry. smartest guys I've interviewed when it comes to this stuff. So hopefully, I was hoping that you were going to give us some real good dirt. Basically, is what I was I'm, asking. I'm, I'm really sorry. That's I, right. I do. I, I'm. I kind of um, think that there tends to be a, a positive correlation between, uh, and this may sound arrogant, but I, I, the, the kind of wiser you get, the the, the less confident you become, um, and and uh, the, some of the most overconfident people are people who aren't necessarily dumb but but are certainly not wise so um i'm not claiming to be super intelligent but i'd like to think that i'm wise enough to know when i when i don't know and i really don't know what's going to happen to the, the u.s economy so i i just rely on my, my trading system to take positions forecasting what will happen for the next month or so and hope that's reasonably accurate is that what you do you shoot out a month is that what's your time frame the average one yeah i mean between for? between say my average holding periods between two weeks and say three months and it depends on the cost of the thing i'm trading so the the more expensive it is to trade the the slower i'll turn over that position and the longer i'll hold it for um the cheaper it is to trade the the faster i can trade it because i spoke about diversification through time frames earlier um you know you can get more diversification by trading faster as well as slower but the problem with trading faster is you pay more in trading costs um so i you know i'd say that the one thing that most people don't pay enough attention to is is trading costs uh, and that's true of a lot of entrepreneurs starting businesses as well, actually. I think a lot of them look at the revenue and think they're doing really well, but they don't look at the costs and actually they may be making a loss. And it's not until the, the bank account's empty that they, they realize what they've, where they've gone wrong. Is there a software program or a couple different software programs that you recommend that could help someone become excellent or even <laughs> decent at uh, futures trading? Like, is there anything you're using that's, you know, would be a great value add to the listeners? Um, I mean... The 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 problem I I struggle to recommend anything. Um, I I actually write all my own software. Um, and I think if you're kind of serious at this, you you probably need to. I mean, there are commercially available packages that that will you know allow you to run simple systems. Um, and um, you know, I, I've never used them myself. I'm sure Bloomberg okay. is that the is that the number one most people use? Is that it? Well, Bloom Bloomberg is is a is a data provider, so it's it's not actually a system that will run a trading strategy for you um it's also very expensive it's about i think it's about three thousand dollars a month now for a for a terminal i i certainly don't use it i can't can't afford it but you know back in the day yeah i used to have a blue terminal but that's just it's just a data provider it's not actually a, a way to run run trading strategies per se um the other some of the concerns i have about some of the commercial packages is they allow you to do things that are potentially dangerous without really an understanding of what's going on because it's basically like you could you know metaphorically it's like a big button you press and it it makes it just makes something happen well what's happening when you press that button what's going on under the hood i you know it's a good question and it's very hard to find out which is why i write my own code because i know exactly what's going on uh, when i was in school that's all we used was bloomberg uh, at duquesne university so they live by it but um it was funny while i was in school they kept showing a guy named jim kramer on tv like he was the go-to guy for investing and the older i get the more i realize he's just a he's just a face he doesn't know shit i don't think so personally uh i look at him and i was like all right whatever he's doing i gotta do the opposite because if you look at his trading it's terrible <laughs> I, actually the the somebody launched a year a few years ago a fund that that exist all it did basically was bet against jim kramer <laughs> and um, he did really well i bet right I, well i don't I, I i don't think it did that well or that badly I, I don't think he was a very good contrarian sell signal but just but you i think he was primarily on tv because he was entertaining that's right um, that's true of a lot of people i guess um and 
I guess if you, I watched him a bit, and he, if you know, he he does. There is a bit of kind of content in what he says in terms of educational content. So, um, the the problem is the more you know, if you go on TV and try and be educational and teach people stuff, um, people just aren't interested. It's not entertaining. They'd rather listen to somebody like I said earlier, you know, who's overconfident, who's willing to give overconfident predictions. Um, and um, you know, people like that's what people like to follow. And I guess. You know, being cynical, the same is true of politicians as well. Anyway, it's true, man. <laughs> yeah, that is absolutely true. But so who did you look up to? Was there an investor? Like, were you a Charlie Munger fanatic? Did you read all of his books? It's uh, it's unfortunate he just passed away recently. But uh, Warren Buffett was the was the go to guy for us to follow while I was in school. And, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I these are these are icons. These are unicorns, basically. They know and th their lives are are all about understanding cash flow and maybe boring boring companies but making a lot of money not in the short run it's all about the long run so who did you look up to were you kind of analyzing certain people's strategies and mimicking them um i mean i have you know i do i do like warren buffett and charlie who uh, may rest in peace and and you know i like i like the way that they talk about the markets uh, and the way they talk about companies um and it's all you know very very sensible um and they, they you know they have that trick of telling you stuff that's true whilst also being entertaining and funny um you know if you read like the berkshire hathaway annual shareholders letters for example there you know there's not many times i could say oh read this annual report you'll find it really fun <laughs> it's not true of almost any company's annual report you read those annual reports and they're both good to read and also um you know very informative um the, the kind of investing that Warren Buffett does doesn't have a lot in common with what I do now. Um, I'd say if there was a person out there who's, you know, the kind of the Warren Buffett, if you like, a systematic trading, it would be um, probably the guy that runs um, Renaissance Technology or he's I think he's retired now. Um, and there's there's a book about him called The Man Who Sold the Market by Gregory Zuckerman, um, which is very good. His name is Jim Simons. Um and he's probably of a similar age to Warren Buffett, actually. Um, and um, he's he's his firm has been the most successful in terms of systematic trading. And actually, although maybe only one in ten of people have heard about him versus Warren Buffett, he's probably made, you know, his returns are probably something like quadruple Warren Buffett's returns. Wow, um, I didn't so, even know um, this guy then. That's yeah, well, exactly, exactly. So, so I recommend um, if if people want to get a a flavor a bit of a flavor about you know that what the sort of thing that i'm that that uh, the systematic trading involves and they want a sort of warren buffett type character then then jim simons uh is is the equivalent i would say you know a question that people always ask me is uh you know who, uh, trump or biden who was better for the rich guys who was better for main street so you look at wall street and hedge funds all that wall street versus main street who made more money under who so in my opinion from all the data i thought the world slash USA Main Street got a little bit wealthier under Trump, but under Biden, I see Wall Street get a little bit wealthier. So is there anything you're able to lend to us and maybe give us some data? That's what I've seen. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I should own up to thinking that Trump, frankly, was an idiot um, and that Biden seems a much more sensible guy. Um, and, and were you located? Were you located? I'll pick on where you located right now uh the united kingdom okay good deal okay England. so continue with that i'm sorry um um i mean from what i saw of trump's kind of let's say microeconomic policies you know his for tax cuts were aimed squarely towards the rich rather than the poor um so you know that's what it was um in terms of data, I mean, this, you know, often see this analysis of people who do things like, oh, what was the average S&P return under, you know, this president or this president? Um, frankly, that that's just noise. You know, you can't kind of form any statistically significant stuff from that because the, the periods of time are just too short. Um, and luck is luck has a big part of it. So, you know, if if, for example, um, Trump had left office on the 1st of January 2020, his S&P returns would have been just you know off the scale um because there was you know like like in 2017 i think that the, there was the market did not go down at all um and that wasn't necessarily because he was doing something that was favoring either the economy or wall street or what have you it was just frankly just luck 
Um, and of course, the pandemic pandemic happened, and that was just bad luck, and that was very bad for the stock market. So, um, so yeah, I I haven't I haven't looked at the data. I, I don't think the data would tell you anything informative. Um, like I said, if I look at things like tax policy, I can certainly see that Trump was much more in favor of people like him than uh, other people. Um, and as I said, I think he was an idiot, frankly. But there we go. You're an honest man. I like that. I disagree with you, but I, you're an honest man. Um, and this is not financial advice for anybody listening, but what are you bullish on? What are you bearish on in the near six months, one month, whatever, whatever you want to look at? Uh, okay. You're going to have to bear with me because I don't actually know. So because I trade systematically, my system kind of just runs itself. And uh, un unless I explicitly go and look, I can't tell you what positions I've got on. So if you just bear with me one second. Yeah, this is fascinating. Guys, if you're paying attention, automation, right? It seems like you have computers working for you and that's how you have this freedom. So I'm a big believer in using software to automate your life and having some virtual assistants and then also have an AI on your favor where it is necessary. So I like what you're saying there, man. Um, so I'm, I've, I've, these, some, a lot of these positions may obviously not be very applicable to people, but I can tell you that, that, um, uh, let's see. Let's, da, 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 da. So I've got short positions in, uh, in, in gas, natural gas, live cattle, uh, us two year bonds. So I think the interest rates are going to go up in the near term. Um, and I'm also short the euro versus the dollar. So I think the dollar is going to strengthen versus the euro. Um, I've got long positions in iron ore, in iron ore, in China, the Chinese rumble yen versus the dollar. So I think the dollar is going to, going to weaken versus the Chinese currency. Um, I'm long Korean bonds. I'm long the Nikkei, which obviously is a Japanese stock index. I'm long Mexican pesos versus US dollars. I'm long Bitcoin, which we've been talking about, obviously. Um, I'm long, um, crude oil um i'm long the taiwanese stock index and i'm also long the japanese yen versus the euro so that's consistent with being short the euro versus dollar so i'm quite bearish on the euro i'd say so i don't have any position at the moment in 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 say you know like a u.s stock market wow um so i you know because basically because the the signals are not strong enough there's no kind of clear direction for me at the moment interesting no, I uh, am a big fan of a book called The Creature from Jekyll Island. Have you ever read that book at all? I haven't, no. Oh, you would love it. Anyway, it talks about the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1912 and uh, the removal of the gold standard, the beginning of it, and then Nixon taking us off the gold standard in 1971. Now, it doesn't talk about Nixon in that book, but the creation of the Federal Reserve. Overall, do you think that was a good thing for the world or a bad thing? Um. I, I guess with this kind of question, uh, I find it hard to answer without considering what the counterfactual would be. Like if the Federal Reserve didn't exist, like what what would the alternative be? And you know, so um, I'm I'm probably going to quote misquote Churchill. Churchill said that democracy is the worst form of government we have, apart from all the other ones. <laughs> um, I kind of think that the the Federal Reserve, or indeed the kind of let's call it the sort of class classical West, you know, sort of central banking system that we have in in you know most developed countries, most advanced countries, you know, there's not a massive amount of difference between the way the Fed works and the way that the Bank of England works in the UK and um, and the way that the, you know the Japanese central bank works, the ECB works. There are some there are differences, of course, you know, like so both the ECB and the Fed are federated systems, so they're they're, they're actually formed of individual banks, whereas the Bank of England is a single entity, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't make much difference. So um, I think they're probably the, the the worst form of, you know, kind of managing the monetary economy that we've got apart from the alternatives. I can't think of an alternative that's better that's been tried that, that would have been more successful, to be honest. You classify yourself as a capitalist, full on capitalist? Um, I mean... Well, I'm a, yeah, I suppose I do, but I also believe that that you know, and you probably inferred that from my earlier comments about Mr. Trump that I, you know, I believe that, that, that there's also a role for a government. If I look at countries that don't have governments or don't have stable governments, then in generally speaking, um, you know, they're not great places to live. Uh, I think there's quite a strong positive correlation between actually the size of the government and how nice a place is to live up to a point. 
you know so north korea i guess is probably not a great place to live has a big government um but you look at somewhere like i don't want to pick on them necessarily but just comes to my mind somewhere like somalia which doesn't have an effective government and is not a very nice place to live um and i think and i know you're going to disagree with me on this but i think you know a lot of european countries with with bigger governments than the uk and certainly the us are much nicer places to live particularly if you're not rich than than countries with smaller governments like the the us and to a lesser extent the uk mm. i guess that you know that's a pretty fair description of what i think mm. so i uh, was the reason why i ask is i didn't know if you're a big fan of milton friedman he's a an economist in the in the us back in the day and i didn't know if you followed his books or his uh his speeches but they're incredible so yeah i've got two I've, I've got two degrees in economics so obviously i've heard of milton friedman and you know read quite fan? His stuff fan Sorry? or no fan of his stuff um <laughs> i mean i guess he's okay he's not my favorite economist <laughs> probably my not my top 20 um i would describe if a, people who are familiar with the sort of in a classical bifurcation of economics of the 20th century you either say you're a, a keynesian or a free a freemanite okay you know john maynard keynes was the um i, I you know was is, you know is the kind of anti-freeman in ways so he believed in a much stronger role for the government um than, than freeman did, did obviously um and hayek is the other guy obviously um so yeah I'm, I'm definitely much more of a keynesian than a freemanite or a, or a, Hay a hayekian that's a word i gotta do more research on him i don't know that one and uh, last two questions I have. Imagine you working for a hedge fund again, you quitting what you're doing and going back to a hedge fund. Would you rather the CEO of that hedge fund to be Trump or Biden? This will help <laughs> out our audience. Who would you rather as a leader? I mean, let's be honest. One created a billion dollar company in the private sector. One became a millionaire in government. Who would you pick? Yeah, one one got given a lot of money by his father and went bankrupt several times and, had, you know, has been done for cheating on his taxes but um i can't imagine well i can't actually i don't really want to go back to work in hedge funds but i can't imagine there'd be any amount of money that would make me have to stay in the same room as trump for longer than five minutes <laughs> never mind work for him i mean you know no no i don't think either trump or biden would necessarily be very good at running hedge funds because they've got no experience in that area so yeah uh, but uh, i can imagine that working for trump would be just the most horrendous experience so, yeah that's a very clear answer for me uh i like your style man you don't even hold back you know where i stand you're not afraid of it that's great La last question i ask all of our guests um is there a book that stands out that you recommend to our to our audience maybe a book that got you to fall in love with trading or just business in general reason why i ask is because my whole life was based off of a book called rich dad poor dad at 22 years old i read it it changed my life it got me to fall in love with reading for the first time got me to fall in love with writing and then i realized why in the hell didn't school give me this book because it taught me how the wealthy think as compared to the poor and that changed my life so that is crucial to my character at this moment so anything like that for you um I mean, it's great that that book got you into reading and writing. I happen to think it's a very badly written book with a poor message, but that's another story. Um, I mean, I can tell you the book that kind of got me into this industry. It's a book called um, The Predictors by Thomas A. Bass. Um, and um, it just, you know, it's it's an entertaining read. It's nonfiction. Um, so it's not, you know, it just gives, it's like a, it gives you a good flavor of, of you know, and it got, for me personally, I read this and thought, I've got to go, I've got to do this, this, you know, I'm compelled now to get into this industry. Um, so it had probably had a strong effect on me as, as Mr. Mr. Kowski's book did, did on you. Um, he's also written an, an earlier book called The Eudonomic Pie, which is about a bunch of people trying to essentially break roulette using toe mounted computers. This is, you know, in the kind of 1980s before computers were much smaller than they are now. Um, so, you know, they had to, you know, build these computers themselves and put them in shoes and stuff. It's a very entertaining read. Um, but, um, yeah, so the predictors by, by Thomas Bass, if, if someone out there reads that and has, it has the same effect on them that it does on me, then, then I want to be doing what I'm doing. So. Excellent. Guys, the book is called advanced futures trading strategies by Rob Carver. Um, you're not, you're, you're obviously well-educated, you know, your stuff. 
a little misinformed when it comes to Trump, but that's we'll fix that later. Don't you worry about that, sir. Anyways, uh, it has been an honor to talk with you. Is there a way for people to reach out to you via social media, a website, anything? Because um, you are by far the most knowledgeable when it comes to uh, this industry. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite hesitant to, to tell people what my Twitter handle is because I've got a horrible feeling that the sort of people who might be listening to this are going to kind of pile on and call me a lefty and a socialist and all kinds no, of other. we're good guys. We're the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, my, my Twitter handle is Investing Idiocy, um, and my website is systematicmoney.org, uh, and from there you can go to my blog and other social media and find out more about my books. So find them on X, not Twitter, on X. Oh, All right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Mr. Musk either, so oh, I'm going to insist, insist on calling it tr Twitter. You teach me about trading, I'll teach you about great leaders, all right? Let's sit down another time. It's been an honor to talk with you, Rob. I really appreciate it. Remember, guys, a million-dollar book will lead to a million-dollar life. Right on.